life that would give him the feeling of being worthwhile. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Between Two Ants. We've got a extra special guest on today. Um, is definitely uh, an artist that has come up in many of these podcasts already. Um, and you, you might know him from such bands as Tap and Die, uh, Kill Holiday, and uh, this, this band called Unbroken that... Uh, yeah. See, it seems to have uh, resonated with one or two hardcore kids over the years. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome, Steve. Yeah, Mill. I'm Steve. To, to Thank you. Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm actually stoked to be here because it's a uh, punk rock and gear, which is you know two things I nerd out about. Nerd out on the most. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> Man. So, so I guess you know, let, let's start at the the beginning like so did where where you grew up like what you know did did you start off like wanting to play an instrument and then fell into punk or was it it vice versa or like what what happened well so san diego grew up in san diego um i started playing guitar when i was eight so i was already playing years before i even knew about punk Um, so yeah when i was God, when I was like in elementary school, I was totally into uh, what the world would call hair bands now, I suppose. But I was totally into like, like Rat, Quiet Riot, Motley Crue. Def Leppard was my band. Yeah, um, still amazing band. So, uh, <laughs> dude, and, Steve Clark was oh one yeah, of, <laughs> one of my hands down favorites. Like, yeah, um, when he died. That was the first like rock and roll casualty that yeah. like actually struck a chord with me. I was just like. Oh, oh no and then like seeing what where they went after hysteria into like when let's get rock came out i was just like it's like but i like this band but this song is not good yeah um <laughs> now steve clark and randy rhodes are the two reasons why i've always gravitated towards less Pauls and marshalls like that's oh, okay. what was those guys um funny enough uh, a few years back at my job, I was fortunate to meet Phil Collin and I jammed uh, Let It Go with him on guitar. And uh, yes. hey. <laughs> of course, I was playing it not the, like a different position than they played. Yeah, yeah. So, but it was just kind of like, it was still cool, like even get schooled by him, you know? But I told him that uh, Steve Clark was a huge, like when I was a kid, like him, the way he was, his presence and everything. And he said, uh, like it was, it wasn't like I was hitting on a nerve. I'm sure he's, you know, well adjusted to it, but like he was very passionate about telling me how close they were and how much he missed them. It was really cool. Oh, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. They do live now. Like it it was so funny. That was, that was for me the same, same band. Like when that was the first like set of video, like around hysteria when that came out, like that's my first concert. Oh really? really? I wanted I wanted to go. Parents wouldn't take me. They're like, we don't like them. You, uh, we're not going. My my mom went, and I got clowned because people thought I had a chaperone. But my mom was fully into it. <laughs> <laughs> no, like yeah, music's always been a thing in my house. So like, my mom's three favorite bands when I was growing up were like Sabbath, Alice Cooper, and Zeppelin. So like oh, like nice. that that kind of music was always like. It was like I was genetically predisposed to like that stuff and totally immerse myself in it. Um, yeah, that's so rad. So yeah, so I started playing when I was eight, and then um, yeah, I didn't discover punk until probably junior high. So I'd already had a few years of guitar under my belt before um, before I you know found it, like really knew about it. You know. So so yeah. what did did you have instruments around? the house or was that like a battle to to get your to get a guitar when you were eight no um what happened was my mom's younger brother was still living at my grandparents house when i was a kid and he had a guitar and some i don't know why or how but they put it in my lap and i was just kind of like just strumming it like i knew what i was doing even though i probably didn't know what i was doing (laughs) and and my parents just took note of that and uh, that christmas i got a guitar i got like i got an acoustic guitar 
And then a couple years later, I ended up inheriting that guitar that my uncle had. Probably oh, when right. I was fourth or fifth grade. What was it? Was it an acoustic guitar, you said? No, my, the first one they gave me was an acoustic. His was a Hondo. Ooh. Oh, nice. What, what, what uh, like a single cut or? Uh, no, like no, it, it was a Strat body. A Strat one. Strat body. Yeah. I took it apart. <laughs> I wanted to know like, how it worked. Uh, I took it apart, ended up in pieces in a closet. Never looked back. <laughs> so never yeah. put it back together? Mm -mm. No. <laughs> so, so where did you go from there? Um, so Christmas at 89, I got a uh, HM Strat, an American one. Oh, that, wow. Those uh, are cool. If uh, you look at the liner notes, the picture on the You Won't Be Back 7-inch, I'm playing a teal bluish green guitar it's uh it's that guitar teal bluish green because if i remember that record uh in the layout on that mandel took some of the photos right probably yeah and uh i think you were playing like an orange guitar is it like it looks like a jackson or charvel no, i gotta no, go back okay. no no it's just okay. uh it's a strat it's it's a it's strat. american made strat but it's got uh, a kaler spider tremolo system on it which is fucking neat um, I, don't, I don't remember those. Yeah, well, because they were, they're not, uh, you can get aftermarket parts now, I think, for them, but they're not something that was like continuously, continuously. <laughs> it's, dude, I still, I have that guitar too. It's just, it's in uh -huh. pieces. Well, not really in pieces, but I mm -hmm. can't really get the, the trim to work right, but it's in the closet where it belongs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Those were pretty great because it was like a seven eighth size body, kind of similar to like the Jackson soloist or Dan Q. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah. You know, in in response to that, but like, what 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 pickup configuration was yours? It's a it was an HSS. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, th th those are rad. I, they they actually just started making them again. Yeah, I know, but they're not. Um, I've seen them. I played it, but it's it's a. Uh, I don't think they're American. Um, Probably not. No, it doesn't. It doesn't even feel the same. Yeah. Oh man, so. So in in that time, so eighty nine, like when 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 was the transition to to like punk? Did um, did you start going to shows around that time or? No, I was uh, aware but not going. Um, I was what 14, 13, 14 that yeah. year. So um, no, by that point, I mean because prior to that, like before I knew punk, I wanted to be Johnny Marr. I was uh, a huge Smiths fan, so I was already learning Smith songs. Before I was listening to the Sex Pistols, which and are then, hard, and those songs are hard. I didn't say I was playing them right. I just <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's just what I was trying to learn. So yeah. Um, yeah, and then somewhere somewhere in seventh eighth grade, probably Minor Threat, Misfits, and Sex Pistols all kind of entered the radar because that's totally the starter kit for like punk kids. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you like the Misfits, you like this and that or whatever, and the the first two Silent Tenses record. Um, oh yeah, that's a good. Th one. Those are like those are like the the door openers. Um, yeah. So yeah, going. I, I didn't really start going to shows until ninety, I think ninety or ninety one. I can't remember. I was, I had a hard time explaining to my parents what exactly was going on that I was going to go see, and <laughs> also not having rides to do a lot of things, like being aware that shows were happening, but not being able to get there. Yeah. Um, but like going going the route i went like we were um punk like like the whole wardrobe like punk rock kids and but always into straight edge even before we knew what straight edge was we had a band um funny enough eric todd and i all from a broken had a band with cliff who went to be in struggle okay. and we were called nation without a clue and it was a total like goth punk band but we had songs like called caffeine free and stuff. We were already like talking about straight edge <laughs> stuff before we even fully, fully knew what it was. You got you know? it. So, so telling my parents, cause I looked, you know, funny hair, combat boots, like the whole wardrobe, but telling them that we didn't do drugs was like, it was kind of a task. Like, you know, I remember one time specifically, I was going to go to some party and these are all like, had to be in ninth grade. And it mm -hmm. had people like Justin Pearson, Todd, Eric, uh, John, John Brady from Swing Kids. Like we were all, yeah. Jose, we were all like, like little kids. Uh -huh. And I remember my dad literally saying, no drugs. And I'm like, we don't do drugs. <laughs> but, but, I, but I looked, 
like I was going to go hang out with a bunch of kids doing drugs. Oh, totally. So, so there was that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like my parents were like amazed. They're like, wait, how did you make it through high school without like getting in the trappings of all this other shit? And I was like, I don't know. Just all my friends don't do drugs. <laughs> oh, well, if, if they asked me, I would tell them your relatives watching all, all their family <laughs> members. Like it was, it was easy to not want to do stuff because I was seeing like my mom's family was fucked up and like, like they were, they were like the, the perfect example of like what not to do. You know what I mean? So I never even wanted to try stuff when I was a kid because I saw all the bad things that already happened first. So when you were in that, in that, the van that was like the goth kind of punk van, what was mm -hmm. your, what amp situation you had? Like what was your first amp? Situation? I was singing. I was just singing. Oh, you were singing. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. Cliff, Cliff from Strobel was playing guitar. Eric was playing bass. Todd was playing drums. And uh, yeah, I just sang. Nice. Where would you guys practice? Todd's house. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Pre-pubescent vocals. I have got one song on a SoundCloud and it's, it's hilarious. And my voice, <laughs> oh my God. I don't think my voice dropped yet. It was, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty funny. Yeah, nice. I, I definitely want to check that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is this but I was, your personal SoundCloud or? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I was always playing. Um, yeah, it was kind of weird. Um, there was even a, a rift between all of us because Cliff was really good. Cliff grew up in a musical family. His dad taught him to play and stuff. And Todd and Eric were two people. And these, I'm talking about Todd and Eric from a broken, obviously. Yeah. Um, they, Eric had just started playing guitar and Todd started playing drums because he had the biggest house and his parents had enough money to buy him drums. So we're like, you, you're the drummer, like you're going to do That's it. So, awesome. um, so I had already been playing and I was kind of like, you know, I could play the Cure songs. I could play the Smith songs. I could figure out the sex with the songs. They were all like super easy to do, which then in turn caused like a rift with everybody. Cause I was like, oh, I can play it. I can do it. I'm cool. Check me out. And, uh, not knowing better. And so, uh, I got, I got banished for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Like he's too good. <laughs> kind kind of, but not not saying it like that, but it was yeah, definitely yeah. like like I didn't know how to handle being Just, for lack of a better word, good at what I was doing or or, yeah. or better than them without like any kind of kind of uh, humility, I suppose. Yeah. Just had more experience. I mean you started earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, because before I wanted to be Brian Baker, I wanted to be Johnny Mars. So that was like yeah. that was the 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 way I was learning how to play guitar. Yeah, yeah. Um so yeah, so what was your first like amp when you first started playing? I had a Roland Jazz Chorus. Um, no, actually, no. Well, when I was when I got the the HM Strat, it came with the Squire Fifteen. I had I had one of those little uh, oh little ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But that Roland Jazz Chorus was uh, not the seventy seven. I think it's like the forty five or something. Um, I got that because it was an all clean amp, and in my mind, if I want to be Johnny Marr, I need a I need a clean amp. Did and you then, have, did that have tens in it? I couldn't tell you. I don't I remember. Do you remember, uh, Fred? What, what, it, um, right, it, it depends. Like the uh, JC 120 was uh, 212. And okay. then um, there they was went a, down from there. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, got a metal zone pedal to stack on top. Yes. Of it, which was absolutely awful. <laughs> so <laughs> bad. It's terrible. <laughs> That's a and and that's actually that's actually the amp that I started practicing with Broken with was playing uh, that jazz chorus with the metal with zone a, with the metal zone yeah. really yeah yeah oh man yeah those pedals those, those were kind of rough just, just a little just a little bit <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 how how much solid state fizz can we cram into a little box and oh. little extra knobs to mess with and and see what you can tweak. So is the metal zone is the second version of the heavy metal pedal or just kind of different? Because I had that. No, actually. So there was a, a trans. I, I think it went uh, HM2 that to metal. the hyper metal, oh. which came out early 90s. And it was kind of short lived. And then the metal zone came out and kind of and I, I don't know if the hyper hyper uh, hyper metal and metal zone like coexisted at the like overlap in in the in the story but yeah god i wish i had still had mine Fuck. i don't i don't know where it is and i'm okay <laughs> I, mean, I, had a, I had an hm2 yeah i didn't have a metal zone. i had an hm2 i had an hm2 for a minute um probably about 10 so years ago I, I wanted it just to have it 
Yeah. But I had no use for it. It wasn't something I was going to, to, to play in a band with, so I sold it. Yeah. So uh, you started it with Unbroken. You were playing with the jazz. And what was uh, everyone else? Did anyone tell you, be like, yo, you got to fucking get a heavier amp? Or you're just kind of like, fuck it. Well, no, Eric Eric had like um, some solid state Fender Congo amp. But we weren't, we were all, you know, just starting out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like at our first, jeez, uh, man, the first, like on that, uh, you'll be back seven inch. I borrowed a carbon head. I didn't even have an amp to record that record with. In fact, oh. the first like handful of shows, uh, I was just borrowing gear. Got it. Yeah. Wow. So, so so where were y'all playing at that point? Was it like actual clubs in in San Diego, or was it um, Shows, like BFW uh, halls and Che Cafe houses? Um, the only club at that time when we first started out was like Soma, and we were not gonna play there. Wow, um, Soma's been around for that long, dude. Soma's been around. Soma's been in three three different venues. They've had Soma. They had it downtown San Diego. They had it down uh, in uh, God, Linda Vista area, and then they have it. I think it's down at the Sports Arena still somewhere. Somewhere yeah. in the okay. Yeah, but Lynn was Lynn's a really bad dude, and uh, he the guy that owned it, and he I think he uh, he punched Eric and threw him out one time. So we're like we're we're not we're not okay. gonna play there. We all ended up playing there later on with different bands, but like at yeah. the time we weren't we weren't doing the club thing. I mean, I was sixteen. Yeah, at that, at that time. So yeah, most of the VFWs are shit. Yeah, shit. Yeah. yeah. So so what other were there was there a, a pretty vibrant hardcore scene at the yeah, time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So oh, yeah. like what about what year would that have been? Like, uh, Broken started playing in 91 but without me they had a uh, so this actually ties into the whole riff thing so we kind of split off and they did their own thing todd and eric and i was doing my thing and like like somehow we we started out here and then we just kind of did this and somehow came, came back. right back <laughs> and at that time they were a four piece and they had this guy brian singing and they recorded a demo that I'm so glad that I'm not on because it's really, it's really, <laughs> it's really bad. Um, and then turn of 92, um, I just, I was, I was, you know, mended fences with them. I was back, back in the fold and I uh, just ended up in the band. And then we uh, kicked out the singer and got Dave. Okay. And, and that was, that was the beginning of 92. Okay. And, yeah. And that yeah. record, the first seven inch and in full length came out in 93 or? <laughs> Well, the seven inch, I think, came out at the end of '92, and then we had recorded uh, Ritual in '92, okay. also. But it came out in, uh, I think, before the summer '93, like right before we went on tour. I think it just came out. Okay. Um, I guess like from, you know, you talked about how you started learning uh, playing guitar, mostly like you know metal. Well, oh, not metal, but like you know, Def Leppard, Def Leppard, and and. Uh, you know, Randy Rhodes and stuff. But when you started getting more into hardcore, I should say less into punk, who were like, what were some of the bands that you're like, oh man, I want to fucking, I want my guitar to sound like this, or I want to play this fucking guitar because so-and-so plays this guitar, you know, or. That's a good question. I think, um, I, I can't say, well, DC, definitely for sure. I mean, like, Gibson Marshall combination. I mean, that was already on my radar. Eric and I obsessed about those before we could afford them. And that was always like the end game. Like when we finally get Les Paul, we yeah. finally get Marshall because we're kids, you know, we don't have any money to buy this stuff yet. And our parents yeah. aren't really taking us seriously enough to say like, Oh, well, I'll help you out. Yeah. Um, but San Diego was very, um, it was very, you in know, in an indirect way aligned with DC in the sense of like, that's just what the bands we knew were playing. So like Pitchfork, John Reese was playing Les Paul and Marshall. That's right. Um, yeah. Heroin, Scott was playing Gibsons and Marshalls. Uh -huh. uh, Cliff and Struggle, Gibson and Marshall. So it was like, it's like the chocolate and peanut butter thing. Like these things just belong together and I, I want to take a bite of that. Yeah, um, yeah. And so that was like, you know, so I mean, obviously, you know, Brian Baker has always been a huge, huge factor with me. But you look at any, I mean, any old, picture of any discord band what are they playing it's going to be yeah. a marshall so um yeah. 
that's that's what I like. But in terms of sound, I mean, I can't really say at that age I had a true understanding of tone to, yeah, to, yeah. Be, to be like, okay, I, this is like, I want that sound. And I, yeah. you know, because I mean, you could hand 10 people the same guitar and amp and all 10 people are probably going to sound oh, different from what I'm saying. Um, so at the time it was more like the visual aesthetic, like Randy Rhodes played Les Paul Custom, Steve Clark played Les Paul Customs, I want a Les Paul Custom. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um John Reese played Les Paul Custom, I want a Les Paul Custom. Um and that I want was like, a Les Paul Custom now, but they're like <laughs> grand. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I got you. covered. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was quite like, uh, let's see, I have, uh, I've sold most of my Gibsons. There's, I have one left that it's like a, a 92 custom shop, um, uh, TV yellow, uh, SG custom triple pickup uh -huh. that like, but it was all Steve Clark, like the triple pickup, like, yeah, yeah. Cause he had those, those Les, he had the two main Les Pauls that were like three pickups. That was like that. <laughs> see. Him, him and uh, Alex Lyson, the only two dudes that get a pass are putting a, 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 a floater on the, on the Les Paul body. <laughs> oh, man, that is fucking sacrilege, but I see where I see where you got that. Yeah. Oh, man, it, those were brutal, too, because they were, like, they weren't actually top-mounted. It was, like, the um, they mounted, like, to a, a stop tail piece, so they, like, slide on to where the really? stop tail is, oh. and then pin into where the the bridge mounts are mm -hmm. and and then like the the locking nuts are like behind the actual nut on, <sighs> on the, on the <laughs> so it, it looks terrible it doesn't stay in tune like it's just it's so which which was your first les paul then the my black custom black oh man yeah. so you're it, talking about, we're talking about like maybe what 94 or something like that i got it in april of 95 so how much did you pay for that guitar back then? $950. Fuck. <laughs> it's a it's a 79. Oh. And, and that was the price. It's yeah. you know what I mean? Like that was that was the price. Yeah. Oh, you bought it new or no, no, I, that's a 79. I got it in yeah. 85. Oh yeah, 70, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, like, yeah. was time traveling. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> I was four when I bought it. <laughs> yeah. I got a I got a 72 uh SG that I play a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was like my main guitar, and I bought it that time from some dude who just needed fucking money for drugs for three hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, it's got an OG Bigsby on it. It is a fucking amazing guitar, and I love it. But like now, I'm trying to like find something similar, it's like you're spending like three grand, man. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've got a I've got a seventy seven SG sitting in a case because I'm gonna sell it. I can't stand. I can't look at it because I know I'm gonna love to party with it. <laughs> oh. I, mean, I mean, that's. It's so painful to to think back on like all of this because like my first Les Paul, I got like a, a black standard. It was like a ninety one, mm. and I think I paid seven fifty for it. Jesus, and it's like fuck. Oh, dude, <laughs> my uh, my first Jason eight hundred, I paid for. I think I got for three fifty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, same you know? thing. Yeah, I got an eight hundred for five five hundred. Mm. Yeah, and I sold That's it like an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> we, we had talked about it before, like even up until like the mid 2000s, like they, I could still, I would still regularly see them for around 500 to $600 on Craigslist, like in Los Angeles. Yeah. The last one I got, I think I paid 550 and then I, I, I maybe sold it for like 700 and then, you know, I was like, cause it, it, I feel like every time I've gotten one, I'm like, yeah, this is this is close, but it's not quite what I want. Then I'll sell it, and then I'll be saying, you know, I really want an eight hundred again. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, it's my favorite amp. It's 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 yeah. it's my. Favorite it is amp. it is a amazing amp. I will say, like I've played nine hundreds, and I was like, man, this is too tinny. The eight hundred just has the perfect. Uh, it's just a great amp with a Les Paul. I mean, you can't beat that combination for sure. No amp should have more than six knobs. That's 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 the rule. That's the rule. That is fair. I, I I don't think my amp got the memo back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I'll, honestly, I mean, it depends what you're doing with it. But I mean, the thing about the 800 is, if you stack the right pedal in front of it, you can you can do anything with it. It's yeah. 
Yeah. It's amazing. Do you, uh, are you, do you pl usually plug in straight or do you, when you're playing like in Broken, did you have a pedal? No. So, and in Broken, um, it's funny now because I wish, again, that I wish there was things I knew then that I know now, but we didn't have the internet yet. There wasn't things where I could like learn, yeah. the, the, you know. Um, so no pedal. We had 50 watts, so they broke up faster. But oh, we also nice. were using uh, EMGs. So instead of using a boost, the pickup was just doing all the work and uh, just plug straight in and those things crunched right up. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, so I've just, I had two studios actually with EMGs in them. I still have a white Les Paul studio from like the late 80s. That's fucking awesome. It's my favorite guitar. And it's got mm -hmm. still two EMG 81s in it. And I was like, I should get rid of these. And I was like, nah, this shit sounds pretty fucking good. <laughs> so I glad that we have you are because it's been brought up in pretty much all of the episodes Fender like, M80, let's do it yes <laughs> <laughs> every time like when we when i'm broken first played chicago we all were just like what fucking amp is that and everyone went out and got these m80s right <laughs> it's such a fucking for a solid state amp that could do fucking pretty much I mean, it could take a beating man i was well, like well sure you you saw it from us we saw it from undertow oh really yeah right. um because they came down and played in san diego and before we knew them and those dudes they're such a petty bone but like those guys are my age you know a yeah. year or two older maybe we're just like these kids these guys are kids you know yeah. they're like 15 to 16 and mark had a uh uh m80 and you know i didn't know the difference between two and solid state at that time yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we looked into it and man, I think a couple hundred bucks, brand new guitar center. Yeah, they're so cheap, man. And, and Eric, Eric, I, I used to say he, he, um, four knobs and all the crunch you could ever need. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, it is a one trick pony, but it's cheap. It could take a beat. My friend's M80, he had the head one. Mm -hmm. It was in a flood completely underwater uh -huh. we we're like shit and he took it out he put like dehumidifiers in front of it for mm -hmm. like a bunch. plugged it back in fired right back up nice <laughs> and, and i like, took mine i took mine um because the one they had the two different versions they had the ones that were like in the the fully gray box you know the, so that had the the, yeah. the face was like the gray with the free whatever yeah. mine didn't have that mine was the kind that it was sitting like a rack mount yeah. And so and so it had like a, um, you know, kind of like a, what do you call it? Uh, just some cheap wood, some cheap wood in the in the frame. So I took that out and I literally sawed that much out of both sides and just condensed it into a little little thing. And Eric went one step further and just fucking took the whole thing out of the box <laughs> 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 and just and just set it down, just set it down on the amp, and got rid of that big big useless box because there were uh, there were so many of those floating around at mm -hmm. uh like chicago like you know shops like just random like not guitar centers but just like random old music stores like you go to and you're like holy shit there's like four of them here for like 150 dollars you know? <laughs> yeah but like when you said like undertow that reminds me and you guys too well, I remember seeing you guys uh, like seeing seven inch of records and stuff like that. And you guys were playing these Les Pauls that are the wood grain ones. They are, yes, Is yes. The, the Paul? The Paul. Yeah. Fucking great guitar. This, uh, this is a 78 and it is a great guitar. I gotta, I gotta rebuild it. I stripped it all out, but when yeah. I bought it, um, Usually the the switch is down here like an SGs, yeah. And someone someone routed it out, so the switch is up here, oh. and then and then I just sanded it all off because it looked too much like a coffee table. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, this is a this is a project I got to work on actually. Um, sitting here, gutless. Yeah, when I I was like, oh man, I want one of those fucking less balls. We can find them; they were kind of rare. Because they were cheap, too. I think I got yeah, yeah. that for 300 bucks. Yeah, yeah. They were really cheap at the time. And I was like, you couldn't find them. Uh, all we we had, for some reason, Chicago had all the fucking Gibson Marauders you could ever want. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it, the, the Paul was big in, like, uh, Richmond, D.C. scene as well. Like, there, um, 
like the guitarist from Sleepy Time Trio played one, and then mm -hmm. because of that, like this band Engine Down that you know formed from uh, Sleepy Time, they all went out, and it was just like it was eight hundreds and the you know the Paul, <laughs> like the Firebrand. Oh. But I remember like in DC area because. Uh, Mike Schleibaum from uh, Darkest Hour had a SG Firebrand, mm -hmm. like which is kind of like the SG version of the Paul. Yeah. Um, but they were floating around. There was also uh, it was like a 335 solid body uh, Firebrand. So I didn't see like, that. I, I I've only seen one. We had a buddy in DC that that picked one up, and it, it was rad like because. There are these awesome guitars that were super cheap compared to like all the other, you know, USA Gibsons, and they weren't Marauders with, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was good enough for Paul Stanley. So yeah, it was. It's true. It's true. <laughs> um, did you? Uh, what did you record? Uh, like Life of Regret with, and, and did you switch? I mean, obviously you switched up tones for uh, Kill Holiday, but did you also play a uh, uh, Les Paul in, in Kill Holiday too? Oh, the Kill Holiday, the Kill Holiday started, I had the Paul, because we started in 94. Oh, okay. um, and then I got the the Les Paul, the custom, and the custom was on all the recordings. So anything we put out had the, the custom on it. Oh, okay. Um, but Life of Regrets and Ivan is. Really? Yeah, um, that was my high school graduation gift that I had no say on, because if I knew my parents were gonna spend money, I'd have gotten Les Paul sooner. <laughs> Uh, what I've yeah. is it? It's a S five forty, I think. It's one of the body first ones. Guitar. My first real guitar was an S five forty LTD. I have that too. Oh I yeah, have, yeah. I have all my guitars. I have everything that I've ever recorded with. Um, funny enough, I got actually a funny story about that. How um, I got rid of it, and yeah. it, I found it because uh, ninety six. I took it to Guitar Center. And I sold it to them, and I ended up picking up this black uh, Tele Custom that's back here. I, I traded into that. Mm -hmm. And years later, like in 99, I think it was, I moved into an apartment with my friend Justin. And he had a roommate that I was like acquaintances with, but I didn't really know. And I came home, and I opened, I walked by his door, he's playing guitar. And I look in, and he's playing this black Ibanez. And I just, right away, I'm like, oh, you still have a guitar just like that. Wait, let me see that. And what I had done, uh, the binding on the headstock, I had busted it off. So there's no binding on there at all. It's just the, the, the front face and the headstock and that's it. And I looked at it, I'm like, dude, where'd you get this? He goes, guitar center. I said, this is my guitar. Like I recorded, he was on a broken fan too. I said, I, this is what I did life on the ground with. He's like, oh my God. So years later I was trying, cause I'd given the Paul away too. I gave it to somebody else. And mm -hmm. I went through this thing. I'm like, oh, I, I would like to have everything I recorded with, you know? So I got the Paul back. And I had been trying to get the Ivanas back from the dude. And he's like, oh, man, if, if, if it was an unbroken, like, I could probably sell it for some money. Uh, so if you want it back, I'll, I'll sell it to you for, like, kept, like, some ridiculous amount of money. Yeah. And I was like, nah, dude, it's not, it, I, I, I'm not that sentimental, you know? So yeah. um, he, this dude was friends with, uh, in, in Sam's story, Sam's first band that he was playing guitar in, the drummer of that band is actually my sister's husband. And oh, interesting. Okay. And and they're friends with this dude. So mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, I think mid 2000s, he, him and his family, you know, whatever they married, kids, they're moving away, and he just went and dropped the gut, the Ivan's off at my sister's house and told her just give it back to me. Oh wow, that's so awesome! I, wow. Yeah, so I got it back. That's crazy. That so, is cool. So so what air so when was the transition from m80 to was it to then 800 mm -hmm. yeah after that so uh 94 94 okay, so yeah. did, did you actually did you record with the m80s at all or was that just a yeah a, <laughs> life love regret <laughs> really yeah ritual too ritual and life love regret are both m80s <laughs> that's so awesome <laughs> mm -hmm. uh yeah, yeah. The, the trick the trick of the M80 and the trick of the any high gain app is if your amp goes to 10 gain wise knock it back to six like yeah. don't don't max it out and we never max them out yeah it's like I I never like it was like the the two knobs that I completely misused 
<laughs> and I kind of use them in reverse now. Contour? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have any amps with contour. <laughs> <laughs> the M80s had a the contour thing. I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, but similar. Uh, yeah. Gain knobs were always turned way up and mid knobs were always turned way down. <laughs> so, oh, like, so now it's reversed. Like, yeah. 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 Oh, Oh, mids. Check that mids, out. Mids, mids, that? don't really need that much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and funny enough, with metal, if more people use mids, they'd have better guitar tones. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, for it's sure. sure. We, and the, specifically, the, when, you tune, when you do, like, low tunings. Oh, yeah, for sure. You need it, because otherwise it just sounds like fucking mud, and it sounds like mm -hmm. it's in a fucking tunnel, you know? It's yeah, like, yeah. that was my problem with the, the rectifier. You know, it's like I have it because it's a workhorse, but um, I have to cut the gain on that thing all the way just so it doesn't sound so machine like. You know, you, 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 yeah. you got to put a two screen for those things too to kind of tighten them back up. Oh, yeah. I should try that. I haven't tried that. Yeah. yeah. There, like, I've got a, a couple rectifier stories. <laughs> like, when, uh, um, when, when we were, and this was kind of like a, a, a tone awakening for me, was like, uh, Darkest Hour was out on tour with um, Lamb of God and uh, Six Feet Under, and we never had like a, a sound guy or anything like that, and um, didn't on that tour. But you know, we're you know kind of the underdogs on the tour, so everybody was like super nice to us. So like, you know, Lamb of God sound guy started doing sound for us, and then one day we were like doing a sound check. He's like, "How do you have your amp set up?" <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, let me let me help you out here. That was it was like a hint. <laughs> <laughs> fix this for you. And it's just like I, and I had a rectifier at the, at the time. It was just like mids up, travel up, bass way down. down. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, gain don't need that much. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh whoa, let, you can hear notes now. This is so neat. <laughs> <laughs> that and that's that was the thing about when you switch to uh an 800 after playing an m80 it's like oh wait i actually have to know what i'm doing now because there's so much more clarity in the, yeah. In the sound yeah i learned that when i started playing uh fender deville just any fender clean app you know and i was like mm -hmm. oh, shit. you know you gotta fucking play you know you got, can't just fucking hit hit noise you know it's like Oh, it, it, it changes too when you start using like PFF, PNF style pickups. So you get real oh, high output sure. stuff. That's when the chime starts happening. You're like, okay, there is everything on here is is, uh, is audible now, you know? Man, did you, um, I guess, like, what was a band, like a hardcore band that you were just like, you know, that, that would play or that you saw, you know, that was from maybe Southern California um, that you were just like, Man, this is the band that's got the energy. They got the fucking riffs. They got the yeah. I was, okay. <laughs> I never, I I never wanted to be in a metal band. I mm -hmm. wanted to be in Chain of Strength. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be in Chain of Strength more than anything else. Could never find a drummer to play like Chris Bratton, and yeah. that was it. Was it, it? If it wasn't gonna be Chris Bratton, it was never gonna happen. So yeah, um, yeah. I never, I never, uh, I never have to do my chain band. Because like, because I, I knew you were, you know, when we we were gonna have you on, I was like, oh, I know, like you're a big Chain Strength fan, and I used to be too, and I was like, I'm gonna go look, go back and listen to this rec these records. I haven't listened to them in a long time, man. That Foundation Seven Inch is so fucking killer, still. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chain of Strength and Swizz, that's okay. that's the two most important. Those are like my top. Two of my top five favorite bands right there. Mm -hmm. Like um everything about both those bands is like what my favorite hardcore is. Yeah. You know, um, because Chain of Strength is also indirectly, I mean they're totally influenced by DC stuff. Mm -hmm. And um once anybody in hardcore embraces rock music, embraces Van Halen or ACDC or anything like that. Like verbal assault, you know, another example of that once yeah. once bands embrace the rock aspect of things and incorporate that into what they're doing, they got my vote. You know, yes, yeah. that's that's, yeah. that's it. So uh chain, chain for sure. Um yeah, that was when I was a kid, that was that was it. I wanted to be, I mean, I want yeah, that's what I wanted. Uh did you played in statue too, right? When they were I, playing I played it, 
I played a show. A show. Uh, yeah. Just for that Rev 25 showcase. Got it. Like man, that's another one of my favorite records, man. Yeah. From that time. It's yeah. So fucking good. Yeah. Um, they uh, they had a history of getting their all, all their guitar players from San Diego. So <laughs> it, it only made sense they tapped that well one more time and gave me the play. <laughs> um, so, so what informed like the the sound that became like unbroken like especially like life love regret I no like it, <laughs> did, was that just out of left field or was well, it, well it's it's a weird it's a weird thing because we without being an asshole but gonna be an asshole like we pretty much didn't like the bands we were playing with. We didn't like the sound. Um, there's a handful of bands we do like. I mean, we're, we were big in Outspoken. We love Undertow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a handful of bands that, and we loved Integrity. I mean, that, that goes without saying. I think everybody who was into hardcore at that time liked Integrity, and they did, and something's wrong with them. Yeah. Um, uh, but the thing is, like, like the, the second wave youth crew thing was just dead, you know? And the whole mosh core thing was starting and we yeah. fell into that trap. Like you won't be back is like that whole mid, yeah. mid upper tempo. Um, let's play E F G E F G. Okay. Oh, let's play high E F G. You know, yeah. um, you know, I used to, yeah. Yeah. I talked a lot of shit and that stuff, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but we were not wanting to be like that. And at the time, like really in the helmet, um, really in the idea of drop D and nobody yeah. in hardcore was doing that yet. At least if, if they were, we didn't know about it because, yeah. again, no internet. Like, there's no yeah, such, yeah. you know, it's like mm -hmm. if someone's doing it and we're doing it at the same time, it's just one of those happy accidents. Like, Slip came out and had Drop D stuff. They were like, yeah. oh. Dude, you know? I was like, oh, my. Yeah, that record changed it. Changed the game for me as far as playing guitar. But we had, we had Life, Love, Regret songs already written before we started recording the Ritual. We were oh. already, we were in 92, we were already doing those songs and we did ritual with, with the songs we did uh, because we were kind of in a rush and all those songs, the ritual stuff, all chemistry wise work together. Like the, the life of regret songs would not work on a record mixed with, with ritual. Um, but if you saw us, if you saw us play live during that time, you'd hear a lot of Durr. All right, the song's like, <laughs> um, so no tuner in your signal chain? Tuners? What's that? <laughs> a, tuner. a tuner was, hey, give me give me an A. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh. we used, dude, we used to tune to the Judge record at home, put on that opening feedback of bringing it down. No All way, right. really. There's your E. And then on landlines, uh, the dial tone was a D. <laughs> Are you serious? That's Dead serious. That's... <laughs> oh, that Dial Dial was a D. Um, but it's, it's like I feel like I mean, there was a lot of bands that did, like Van Halen didn't use to like like first couple records. Like it's just like give me an A. You know, yeah. write tunes to whoever had an A. Back in Black is like one of those oh, yeah. records Thank where it's, it, it's not it's not perfectly an A four four. Right. It's like some weird like tweaked a little bit, you know. Yeah, like trying to. My daughter's been uh, learning guitar, and she she loves ACDC. So I was like trying to play. Yeah, you know, I was like tuned up her guitar. I was like, here you go, put on TNT, and it's like not at all, not even close. Like it's like a quarter step off yeah. <laughs> of whatever they tuned to. Yeah. I was like, huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember when I first start when Hope Conspiracy first started. I showed up to practice. And I didn't have like a, I didn't have a tuner. Like I was like, yeah, don't you guys just tune like this? <laughs> like, uh, no, <laughs> you need a one, a noise gate and yep. the tuner. That's it. <laughs> People underestimate the noise gate. That's, that's a, that's a big deal. The noise gate like changed the way that, we, that I played for sure. But because mm -hmm. I'm more of a, definitely more of a noisy player um, and like more loose. And the other guys in Hokan were from Harvest, which is like a really tight kind of Meshuggah style band. Yeah. And then they're like, you need a noise gate. And then I was like, oh my God, that's how you guys got those like super start and stop parts that are just silent, you know? But, but even just to eliminate the, yeah, oh then, my God. you know, um, cause I don't run, um, 
you know, even plugging in just straight to a, a Marshall, I keep it on there, especially when I was singing in bands, you know, because it just sounds really unprofessional between songs. You're trying to talk and you just hear amps in the back out the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the hissing. So mm -hmm. I'd use it for that. I never really used it for um, tightening up my sound because I've never been tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had we had that um, basically because when there's a stop, it cuts everything, you mm -hmm. know, but then times when I like I need more sustain, I'll turn it off, you know? Yeah. But it was definitely like the tuning thing. I was like, oh, yeah, tuner. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, we, we ended up getting tuners later on, though. I think we had some, uh, I forgot who made it. It was just one of those like straight through, though you don't hit a switch. You just turn your amp off and you can run it through the. Um, oh, yeah. Was it the Boss TU-12? Was it, was it a. <sighs> is, is there That's like the little square. Uh, but, but, rectangle but, the, or... but the front of it was kind of sloped down with the screen you could see. Oh, I know what you're talking oh, about. I, I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. It had like a white, like mm -hmm. white inset, right? It had like yeah. dotted like lights on it. Yeah. Yeah. But the T the T twelve was the one that had the case, right? They yeah, the case. It, and the cool players would put it under their head but above their cabinet. Yep. Yep. There you go. Super cool over first here. Person Actually, I saw, first person <laughs> I saw with that was Duncan. <laughs> Duncan from Endpoint Guilt had one of those, and I was uh -huh. like, "What is that thing?" Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't go that route. Um, wasn't until uh, well, I got the, the TU2, the Boss Floor floor Tuner. That was, that's, that's, when, that's when I matured. That's when I was growing up. <laughs> you no longer had to turn the amp or put the amp on standby or mm -hmm. the yeah. M80 case uh, off. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so Life Floor Regret, you guys tuned to, it was drop tuned, right? You said Yeah, it's all D. Drop yeah, D. okay, it drop tuned. And then... Uh, how did your like what you guys was it gear that kind of changed your writing style for the next like two seven inches or was it just kind of like you guys were listening to other stuff like and then you're like we're gonna sound like this because we don't want to sound like 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 you said like these other bands that are just kind of regurgitating stuff over and over again yeah because it was getting way metallic it was getting uh but not not cool you know because yeah. there's obviously a right and wrong way to do things and a lot of wrong was happening and it's kind of like <laughs> um i'm opinionated don't get me wrong <laughs> um it was like it just wasn't like not relatable for us and i you know it's funny because the next record was the and fallen proverb mm -hmm. and eric wrote and i wrote fallen proverb and i remember when i wrote it you i mean being a san diego band you can't help but being influenced by jay you know it's yeah. like it's yeah. and so when i wrote that it was my version of an unbroken jehu song in fact the whole beginning of the song with the da -da 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 -da, like the the guitar thing that's mm -hmm. the first song on the first jehu record oh yeah Look i'm playing like. i'm playing a d he's playing an a sharp mine was a do 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 and i remember i remember showing it to those guys like hey i have this song but you probably won't dig it it's it's not really an unbroken song you know um, and I played it for him and, uh, there was, yeah, let's do that. And, and, and fallen proverb was, was its thing. And the same thing with the last, last songs, it was just like a constant evolution. I mean, yeah. San Diego is just a different place than, than other, other, uh, scenes. And like, there's so much diversity, sonic diversity in there that you can't like, it's almost so self-contained. We influence ourselves, you know, like the, the, the city, you know, this band, we love heroin, we love Antioch heroin, we love all the grounding yeah. stuff. It's like, it's like, well, how do we, you know, we love rock from the crypt, you know, it's like, let's mm -hmm. find a way to melt this. Because the thing is, when you write songs, I mean, um, just because you're influenced by something doesn't necessarily mean you're going to sound like that thing, you know, totally. like you, totally. you could pull, you could pull from all these, these things, but like, what you write is still going to be you if you're good at your craft, you know, like if you have a style or a flavor of, of you, you do things, no matter who you're stealing from, you're still going to make it your own. And yeah, I think, it, yeah. Totally. And, I think, and I think that's what happened. So, um, you know, and is like, you know, what if you had quicksand and rocket writing a song, Yeah, you, yeah, know? yeah. It, you know, and like I said, my fallen proverb was straight up just like, okay, I love Jay. I love John Reese's playing because in unbroken, ironically, my two biggest influences on what I played was Randy Rhodes and, and John Reese. It was oh, how, right. 
how could I make these squeal? Like, if you listen to the Ozzy tribute album, like every squeal Randy Rose would do, he just bend them up, you know, not not like an annoying Zach Wild squeal, but like, <laughs> but, I but I like I like his squeals too. <laughs> yeah, but, dude, but he doesn't know when to lay off. It's just like, oh it's, no, it's just like it's not, t- it's not tasteful. It's 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 too it, many. It, it, it used to be. It's not anymore. <laughs> um, but Randy, but Randy Rose would do them where he would like where where and he like tweak them, you know. Um, and I stole that. I would I would tweak the the pinch all the time because of him. Um, and then John Reese was like, "All right, well let's uh, the spastic strumming or using uh, EMGs and putting it against your your eight hundred and making the tube squeal and getting those ray gun noises that he would do, you know, um, and just being sloppy. I mean, San Diego just had that element of punk where you know heroin just dudes go nuts oh, yeah. and just yeah. just being chaotic and so like. You know, we talk about the noise gate thing, but the noise gate and broken would just be ridiculous. I know. Um, the, the... <laughs> well, that's, that was the thing when I first started because I was like, I wanted to be noisy. You know, I saw you guys, I saw Undertow. It wasn't like this like mosh core, you know what I'm saying? Like you didn't want to be like that. And then, yeah. you know, when I started playing Hokan, I was like, oh, I can see where you can use the noise gate and I can still have my sound, which is because the other guitar player was very tight and very like kind of robotic. And I was able to really open up and just kind of like be me, you know, in a way, but mm-hmm. still kind of do the blend. But I totally get it. Yeah. yeah. It's like you wouldn't be that band if you had X, you know, this this type of gear that you're playing. With. And and Eric and I, we really rubbed off of each other. Um, we're different and similar in so many ways in in that world and, and playing uh, Unbroken. And I was playing in, in this band called Julia at the time, too, when I was in high school. Yeah, I remember that. Definitely. And, yeah. And so, like, Eric was kind of branched out doing Swing Kids, and I was doing Julia, and Julia was way more, um, I don't know, it, it, you, you called it emo then because there was no other I word know. for that genre, but, yeah. like, the noisier, you know, it's cool to yeah. roll around the floor and act like you're crying kind of shit when you make a bunch of noise. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I actually love those bands. I, that stuff is making a comeback, apparently. Is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's what I <laughs> Me, you know, like, oh, get yeah. get a frail reunion going, or I I, I like frail. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was it Ports to Pass? Were they from then? Oh or? yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, Indian Summer, all that yeah, stuff. Summer Indian Summer a lot. Yeah, Mohinder, oh. uh, Moss Icon. I love that shit. Was really good. Yeah. Um, so what what was the? Did you have any or take any influences that would? surprise people like outside of like like in in pop music or even like main like anything that like you would draw from for songwriting outside uh you know kind of the punk scene in san diego that's like no i don't know i don't know i mean just naming randy rose would be kind of like well yeah i know i i guess that kind of fits <laughs> that, that would be something because it's not something you hear and i'm in my playing uh but it was something that was influential to the way i wanted to make noise you know what i mean um yeah now i mean the thing about hardcore like i wasn't really into a lot of the stuff in the 90s i was i'm stuck in the 80s i'm still stuck in the 80s mm-hmm. um this very few bands that were in the '90s that I like, and there are bands in when the when the century turned. But it, I liked more of the metal sounding stuff, and I was never really a metal metal fan, you know. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird. Um, it's it's ironic in a way because Eric and I are not metal people, yet we wrote stuff that helped influence metal in hardcore. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, sure. But. I didn't, I, I wouldn't listen to us. <laughs> like, in, 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 Back in, then, in, right? Yeah, in 94, if you handed me a band that sounded like Unbroken, I'd probably be like, okay, because I didn't care for the other bands that were that, of a similar sound at the time. You know what I mean? Um, it's kind of weird. You guys recorded the Seven Inches with Issa, right? And Ken Olden. We did the Anfall proper with Ken. Yeah. So what gear did you guys have? Because that was on the road, right? You guys did that in... Yeah, we used uh, we used Ken's uh, A hundreds, and he used that rap pedal, get that uh, yeah. that sound. Which I never, I said, yeah, let's do it. It's it's cool. It's very, uh, it's noisy. It, it's yeah, yeah. it's ugly, um, but in a good way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
not something I would have done. I would never put a rap paddle in front of an 800, but he did it. And I was like, well, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there's something, the, the secret sauce that, in that, that, like, I was just listening to um, No More Dreams, the record. Damnation. Yeah, yeah, Damnation, the other, uh, the day before yesterday. And, like, that guitar tone is insane. Like, yeah. I mean, it's just like, it's, I'm just, I don't know if it's something that I would play. Yeah. But it's just like, I for love that, that it exists. Yeah. For that <laughs> band and for that, like, what they're going for, it just fit. You know, yeah. you're like, oh, this makes sense. You know? But, but that's the thing we're talking about. Like, we use Ken's rig, but it doesn't sound like their stuff. It's still exactly. Like, like if you, like, like you tell me now that you've used Ken's rig, I was like, oh, really? Cause it sounds like you. It doesn't yeah. sound like Ken. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's weird, man. All the, all the unbroken stuff when we started playing shows again, like every rented 800 I used, it still sounded like I watched videos and I'm like, yeah, it's still me. Like it's everything sounds like my, my setup. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's like that. Uh, I always reference that clip from American article when Ian's talking about how Tina was playing with bad brains and he was letting Daryl use his, his rig. And he's yeah. like, you know, sorry, my shit sucks basically. And then he hears him play. He's like, Oh, wasn't the guy, it wasn't the guy, yeah, it was the player, <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's, you know, um, anybody who's good can make a Squire 15 sound like a good amp, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, like, that's, that's kind of like where we, I mean, Fred and I whole started the whole thing, because it's like, a lot of people go out and just get the best gear, and you're like, you can make the best gear sound shitty. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and, one, if you can't, if you don't know what you're doing, but uh, a lot of us didn't, but we all, I also had shitty gear, so it didn't yeah. Matter. But, well, yeah. that's that was my whole gripe with all like the you know, and the 5150 became a thing and the, the triple rectifiers and stuff where people are getting these high gain amps and then using 81 EMGs and just diming that gain out. And it's like, oh man, like yeah. less is more, mm -hmm. less is more, you know what I mean? Um, active pickups to do a high gain amp, I'm like, what do you <laughs> <laughs> that was my setup for a lot. And then I started playing a Strat with mm -hmm. a little, uh, actually, let me see. I got it right here. I started playing this, this Strat, American Strat. Uh, Telly. You guys see it? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. I'll let, I'll let you do it. You kept laying it in. I was just like, you can't. Wait, what happened? That's a Telly. Oh, yeah. Telly, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, I was like, oh, wait. Yeah, it's a Telecaster. Yeah. Oh, man, this this track feels foreign to me. Uh, where's the other pedal at? And yeah, I play this telly through a, um, a 5150, old one, like mm -hmm. one of my first ones. It sounded great. Yeah. I mean, I was like, but it's a totally different sound. You know, there is that, you still get that telly, but everyone's like, dude, you're playing a telly through a fucking 5150? And I was like, eh, it's it works. You know, it, it gives me more rock tone for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. And as I started recording more, I, I kind of got my own like kind of sound where it's like, I don't want high gain. I want it to sound more rock and roll than fucking metal, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I can still play like heavier bands and hardcore bands, but I want it more rock and roll, not metal. But a rad metal band is a band that uses less gain. That's, I mean, yeah. you listen to like any uh, like Saxon or any like 80s, late 70s, 80s, where the, they're just all using JMPs. You know what I mean? <laughs> and and their tone is perfect. Mm -hmm. It's like perfect. The, it like it still blows my mind that like listening to like the Vivian Campbell era like Dio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Like his tone is so freaking clean. Like there's no gain on it, and he's just shredding all Super. over the place. And it's per it's it's perfect. It sounds amazing. Like. You don't, he, he doesn't need high gain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's not a lot of delay, not a lot of reverb. It's just like all hands. You know, a great example of the, 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 the bad element aspect of high gain is how Van Hagar and everything after that sucks when Eddie Van Halen had all the great tone on the first six records of Daily Roth with the Marshalls, you know? Yeah. And then they started going to Saldano getting all that stuff and it started getting more fizzy gain in the sound. And it was like, nah, 
Mm-hmm. It's inter- like I've been learning more like through uh, like YouTube as a rabbit hole for all of the like Eddie Van Halen, like tone secrets and like evolution of what his rig was like from 5150 on like um, like there's some reports that he wasn't even really using cabinets mm. like on that. It was all like these load boxes that they were sending out direct to to tape and like it was all his rack gear and stuff like that and it's like a very different very noticeably different tone i and for the record i've got no beef with 5150s i've got no beef with with the rectifiers like if that's your thing i i borrowed a first series uh 5150 for a while and messed around with it and i i liked it it it, it's cool um it's not me it's not my thing but like yeah going with with that take though where it's like i again to me technology is not always a great thing with with certain gear certain advancements where it's like too much like my my thing with this is where if i have too many options it's a headache and i don't want that i'd rather make the most out of less and live with that than i would have going okay i've got all these rows of knobs now like this dude um i did a band orange county uh, called Crush on You, which actually Indecision is going to put that out finally. Oh, um, awesome. But it was like a, you know, kind of like a, a pop punk rock and roll kind of sound and whatnot. Awesome. You know? And I was playing, uh, depending on how I was feeling, I either play that 800 or I play this Plexi behind me. You guys can see that. Oh, dude. So what year is that Plexi? Okay, so get ready. Um, <laughs> it's a limited edition 97 Plexi they made for Nam. So only 250 of that amp exist. Uh, they made 250 of the 50s, 50 watts, which is that, 250 of the 100 watt plexis, and 250 of the blues breaker. And they released them for an amp that year. God damn it. God damn it. So is, is, it, is, is it the 1987 yep. X? Oh, mm-hmm. God. Yeah. Damn. Those, those are kind of perfect. Yeah. Like, I, I, I because like, <laughs> damn it. Like, cause like a lot of the, like the ACDC, t- like a, on a, a, a lot of the records were. JT 45s. Well, actually, no, it was the, it was the 1987 X. Was, was it? Like, it was okay. Using, um, I, I, it was, I think Powerage was a, a 50 watt. Okay. Um, but he, he had one that was like kind of, he, he doesn't remember like the, the tech, cause like. <laughs> I don't know if you've watched any like it, there's like a rig rundown of like yeah their, like, yeah and it's like you know they have like a full like uh back like backups for backups and backups so it's like a hundred heads out on the road with yeah, yeah. in various stages of disrepair. <laughs> That's gnarly. I know. I, I did see that one. Um. But yeah. There. It's definitely like um. Dave Dave Friedman from Friedman Amps was talking about like what the the heads were on on certain uh on certain albums because i always thought like i I think jtm 45s were definitely in there but i think some of the like back in black was a 50 watt um yeah which i didn't realize and then yeah so (laughs) long story short that had rips (laughs) (laughs) i uh i traded an ampic 810 base cabinet to some dude for that are you serious shut up (laughs) Oh my god! Oh man, that is a fucking steal. Holy I know. Shit. And, and and ironically, um, the eight hundred I have when I was on a broken, it stopped working. I didn't have the money to get it fixed because we're you know, there comes a point in your life where you could afford to now add on to your gear. But yeah. this was that point in your life before that where you had to get rid of gear to get other gear. You couldn't oh, gear. Just, oh yeah. You know, and so this is one of those times where I needed a, uh, I was playing bass in a band called Love Light Shine, which is post J June, like the band those dudes did okay. with J June. Um, and so I needed a bass rig and I ended up parting with that 800 to get the 810 cabinet from this dude. And it, the amp didn't work. So I was kind of like, well, I'm not, I can't fix it. I already had, I had a, a hundred watt JMP at the time. Um, so I was like, okay, I, this, this amp's expendable. I can get rid of this. And I always regretted that because, you know, that's an awesome amp. It was an 8250 watt 800 that I no longer have, but then I got my, you know, got this 
plexi and it's placed for the same base cabinet. So it almost like in my, in my mind, I traded the 800 and got a plexi out of it, but you know, well, did, did you give the guy the, uh, did you save like the text in the Craigslist ad for when uh, he, he was going to sell the uh, 810 inevitably? <laughs> no, it was a, it was a roommate. It was a roommate. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, that's a fucking good, that's a steal. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. And, well, um, I, I know we've, we've ha- held you out here for, for quite a while. Um, is there an eighth that you want to plug or? Uh, uh, yeah. I'm boring. I've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me ask you: this. Uh, If there is one piece of gear that you have had the whole time that you need, absolutely, like is it a pedal, guitar, amp, whatever? It looks like it's a JCM 800, no matter what. I have, I, I have everything I need, and and um, I always have these nerd talks with friends and say like, okay, man, if you could have one piece of gear right now, if you could get one thing, what would you get? And I'm like, well, I have everything that I could possibly need. Um, you know, I've got the cabin I want. I've got the speakers I want. I've got the heads I want. I've got every guitar I need. I've got like, you know, a couple customs. I've got a, some standards. I've got a special Rogue P90s. I've got a, a Jaguar. I've got a Strat. I've got two Tellys. Like all the all the soundscapes that I could possibly need for something um, are here in this room. Um, I've got combo amps. I've got the big amps. So it's like all the different, you know, food groups are representative. But then ironically, I really just use one guitar and one amp. So (laughs) it's, um, and the same thing with pedals. I've got all these, all these pedals and I, they're useless to me. I have them, but I don't, I don't mess around with them. Kill Holiday, I I ran a a ton of pedals and that was like kind of annoying um, because we're doing more of like a shoegazy mix of stuff and that revelation stuff. And so that oh and actually that band that uh i played in when we played with you guys at the when you were doing beginners oh yeah uh, yeah that band i used i used a ton of pedals but i was just just playing guitar so i didn't have to really worry about uh, singing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i kind of i've kind of reached my wits with pedals so i bought one of those line six um floor bottles and i'm like this, i'm pulling my hair out because i'm sick of carrying gear so i'm like Fred knows I'm like trying different like little pedal power amps and shit. I'm just like, you know what? And the other other day we just plugged it straight into a fucking amp. And we're like, all right, well, that's it. <laughs> no, no fractals, no helix, no uh yeah, campers. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know. I was really bummed when uh to see Dagnassi and Brian Baker had the Kemper, but he ran the 800 on on the front, but you saw the Kemper back there behind him, and he was using that as his 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 sound. And I was like, Oh dude, you're, Oh really? You're the master right now. And you're playing a camper. What's going on here? But then I watched, um, I watched a bad religion rundown thing where he, t- he had a good point where he was saying he had the headset up, but he also had the camper and the front of the house might get the, the camper or they yeah. might, you know, work with the sound guy. He might dial it in like, which, which one's working better, which one's giving you a better overall sound. that works best for the band. I can respect that. Um, yeah, you know, that works. I mean, they sounded like one uh, at that. Was it the show that was in the, at the observatory? That's where I saw them. I missed that one. That's why they sounded my, so good, man. Where my, where, where my other hero came out, Jason Farrell, and played. Uh, yeah. Played a song. I was. Uh, we played Tap and I played with him the night before in San Diego. Oh, you and did. Then, yeah, and then I had a gnarly sinus infection, and I had to give my ticket away. Um, oh. And uh, I didn't get to go to that one observatory where I was going to go. But. So one time, uh, I think Ryan Patterson was out here and he was, he's friends with those guys. And I think Red Hair had just played and they were staying at, I think Jason Farrell lives in LA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they were staying at his house and Ryan's like, hey, come over, hang out. You know, I was like, okay, cool. I go over. He's like, dude, there's a, there's the fucking minor threat marshal that's right in that room. <laughs> He's the, like that's the Marshall that was played on the Minor Threat records. <laughs> so, so in ni- the mid '90s, uh, Kill Holiday and Blue Tip would kind of play shows together when they come out here, yeah. and and I became friends with Jason then. Mm-hmm. And and I wouldn't say friends; I would say more like I was a Punisher. I'm still a Punisher yeah. to that guy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- there's there's few people I really nerd out on and like punish, and he's unfortunately one of them, and I feel bad about that. Um, 
But I had broken a string during a Kehade set, and he gives me his last Paul. And, oh, man. <laughs> and so and so in my mind, I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, I'm playing, playing Suze guitar, playing Suze guitar, right? And years later, I'm sitting with him and Dave Stern at the Shea, uh-huh. and I told him about that, how I was, like, geeked up inside, like, oh, my God, I'm playing a Suze guitar. And they were laughing at me. And I was like, oh, dude, they're, like, <laughs> make, they're making fun of me. So then at another time, I brought that up to Jason saying, yo, you guys are clowning me when I was talking about how geeked out I was playing the Swiss guitar. Like, oh, no, we were laughing that you had no idea that I bought that from Brian Baker. You were playing one of his guitars from Dag Nasty and My Threat Stuff. And I was like, oh, oh. shit. <laughs> You're like, what? Yeah, that was like a whole new spin on it. I was like, <laughs> okay, um, I wish I'd never washed my hands. Maybe I could have gotten it. <laughs> You know, because, I mean, truth be told, out of all the, the guitar players in hardcore that are the biggest two influences on me is Brian Baker and Jason Trout. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was, I touched the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah when, I saw, when I saw Jason Farrell play, I was like, he he feels, it just seems like he's flawless. When he's he's like, the coolest I, guitar player. It's just, like, he's just, like, it's just like so cool looking. I'm just like. He, he, he was like, he was the the man of myths when I was a kid, like I remember someone told me one time and, and Jason told me this wasn't true, but someone told me that he would run a, uh, a, he had a duffel bag, right. And something was in there, some kind of setup, some pile or something magical. And so you'd see the guitar cable going into this duffel bag and another <laughs> cable coming out of that bag into his head. And that was, that was his sound. And I remember asking him one time because on like the, the final Swiss seven inch, his tone is a little more rugged. It's it's got a little more bite to it. And I asked him, like, did you did you push that amp? Like, what did you use anything to get that sound? He's like, no, man. It was just the way they, they caught it in the studio. I've never I've never used anything but just plugging straight into the amp. And then I brought up that thing. I'm like, oh, I used to. There was like a whole rumor about you years ago that you had some secret thing in a duffel bag and nobody could ever know what it was. Like you had the, the secret of Nim inside there, some magical <laughs> magical thing, and and uh, and it was uh, a big mystery. And now that was disproven. Oh, man. Well, I just plug into this bag, and then the bag... <laughs> the bag doesn't rest. Yeah. Are you going to run a bag in your signal, too? Yeah. <laughs> not, not cool, bro. No. Well, Steve, thanks a lot, man. Thanks yeah. for taking the time, man. I really appreciate it. This is, like, really awesome. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, this is something I could talk about all, t- all night, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I love it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was gonna say, like, I, I think for me, um, absentee debate is probably one of my favorite hardcore songs slash songs of all time. Oh, that's so, really cool. Uh, re- really appreciate you coming on. It's really cool. Thanks for having good me. To, I appreciate good it. Good to chat with you. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Hope, Thank you. Hope we get to do it again. Yeah. Any anytime. Uh, all right. Next anytime. next time we'll talk about. Just amps, and then we'll <laughs> <laughs> uh, try, try a couple different duffel bags in our duffel signal, bags. Signal yeah, see, yeah. We'll talk about pedals that we don't use, good. but we have because I am the same way. <laughs> so I, I lied to you. Everything I've been doing on the records is a crate blue voodoo. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Man.